I'd like you to imagine for a moment living in Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple. There were all kinds of sacrifices that God required of the Israelites. Burnt offering, grain offering, sin offering, trespass offering, and various types of peace offerings. Well, the large feast days, they required animal sacrifices. And then every morning and evening throughout the year, a lamb was sacrificed. To kind of give you a little bit more vivid image, at the dedication of the Temple of Solomon, 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep were sacrificed over a two-week period. It's not really the time to be a cow or sheep. But we can only imagine the smell and noise from the animals. And then on top of that, it would be hard to ignore the smell from the blood of sacrifice. Today, we wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. Peter would come in and they would shut the whole operation down. People today may even criticize or judge those who did this before. But an important question to ask ourselves when we're looking into the past is, why did the Israelites do this? Well, first and foremost, it was in the law of God for the Israelites to offer sacrifice. One reason was because Israel was surrounded by pagan nations. These nations, they practiced idolatry by worshiping gods like Hathor, who took the form of a cow, or Ares, who took the form of a sheep. By God requiring Israel to sacrifice the things that the pagans venerated, it was a reminder that the God of Israel was the one true God, and all the rest were false gods. And the Israelites, they had to wage a daily war against idolatry by animal sacrifice. Now, another reason for animal sacrifice was because sin required sacrifice to make atonement for the wrong committed. The death of an animal, it showed the seriousness of the sin, but it was also thought that life was in the blood. And so the animal sacrifice was a symbol of our lives being offered entirely to God in atonement for our sins. The animal, it took the place of us. It was an exterior sign of hopefully an interior change. Uh, death to the life of sin, and an offering of our whole lives to God. But these animal sacrifices, they were only temporary. It was preparation for what was to come. And it had value in the eyes of God because of what and who it represented, the one true lamb of sacrifice who would offer the perfect sacrifice for us. Jesus, he speaks about this sacrifice in our gospel today. When he's in the upper room, uh, he's having the the last supper with his disciples, and he took the cup and said, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. So at the last supper, the sacrifice of Christ begins. The blood he's offering is his blood that will be shed on the cross. The cross will be the altar of sacrifice. And what God is doing through Christ's sacrifice is he's making a new covenant with us. And we see some elements of a covenant in our first reading. The Israelites, they agreed to do everything God had commanded them. And then blood was sprinkled on the altar, which was a symbol of God, and then on the people who were symbolized by the twelve pillars. The blood, it united them, but it also came with a warning. Scott Hahn said that the sprinkling meant, may my blood be shed like the blood of this animal if I do not maintain the obligations of this covenant. And so the covenant, it came with a blessing, but also a curse if one of the parties didn't live up to their end of the deal. Well, the blessing in Christ's sacrifice is that we're given eternal life if we abide by by the obligations God made with us, that as long as we're faithful to his commandments. The curse would be if we remain obstinate and we continue living the life of sin. If we reject the sacrifice that Christ made for us, then rather than life, we'd experience death. God the Father, he once told Catherine of Siena that her sacrifice and prayers would help the souls of sinners. God would show them mercy because of her faith, but their obstinacy and despair would condemn them through the contempt of the blood of Christ, which has restored them. What this is saying is that God gives people grace, but they can refuse it. The sad thing is that by rejecting Jesus' sacrifice, they choose death over life. They're basically saying that they enjoy the life of sin more than the life of grace. They don't realize the incredible exchange that God wants to make with us through the blood of Christ. 
I was reading the other day that uh, the phrase used when two parties make a covenant was to cut a covenant. And cut because sacrifice was involved. Blood was poured out. An example in our day may be when two people make a pact and they may cut their hand or their wrist and then unite that to the cut hand or wrist of the other person. Their blood would be mixed and they'd become one, so to speak. Well, if we relate this to the Eucharist, Not only does Christ pour out his blood as expiation for our sins or as atonement for our sins, but then he gives his flesh and blood to us as food and drink. When we receive him in the Eucharist, his blood is mixed with ours. We become united to Christ and become one with him. St. Maximilian Kolbe, he once phrased it like this. He said, you come to me and and unite yourself intimately to me under the form of nourishment. Your blood now runs in mine. Your soul incarnate God compenetrates mine, giving courage and support. What miracles? Who would have ever imagined such? And then he goes on to say that the culmination of the Mass is not the consecration, but communion. The sacrifice of Christ, brothers and sisters, makes it possible for us to have communion with God once again. Through Christ, we can walk with God. We become friends and children of God. And communion, that's something that the world needs desperately today. But sometimes we may sacrifice communion for other things. Take, for example, technology. It's good when it's used for its intended purpose, but how many of us spend more hours on technology than we should? We may get to the end of the day and then realize we spent a lot more hours on TV, uh, the internet, and playing games, and no time with God in prayer. Or we may hide behind technology rather than encouraging, uh, rather than encountering the other person, or even sitting with God in the silence. I mean, how many of us have gone out to uh, dinner and we spend half the conversation with someone looking down at our phone? If we let it, Com, uh, if we let it, uh, technology, it can isolate us from God and others. It can cause us to live in our own little worlds and get comfortable there, too. But if we saw the sacrifice of Christ, if we saw it on this altar, like those sacrifices of old, that, that bloody sacrifice, I think it would make us realize the seriousness of our sins and also better remind us that Christ what Christ, what God was willing to offer for us and continues to offer for us in the Eucharist is himself. And it's the great exchange I was mentioning earlier. He gives his life so that we can have life through him. Not an isolated life separated from everyone else, but one united to God and others. And this is our destiny. It's the greatest effect of the Eucharist. It's unity or communion with God and others that will one day lead to eternal life.